From its founding in 2002 until the summer of 2015, the infidelity website Ashley Madison used the tagline, life is short, have an affair. And it was popular. By 2015, the company had launched in 40 countries. It claimed 37.6 million users, enticed by a fantasy mainly aimed at men, access to a list of women ready and willing to have an affair, a secret good time outside the bounds of marriage. And why not? The users were promised they would be anonymous and that the website was, quote, 100% discreet. It wasn't. That fantasy imploded in July 2015 when a hacker released the personal details of more than 30 million users. Names, addresses, sexual preferences and fantasies, credit card information, and personal messages. The fallout was immediate and included a score of resignations, divorces, and suicides. Among the names made public were many professing Christians and Christian leaders. Every one of them instantly regretted their actions and wished it had never happened. But it did. If you would like to protect yourself from the devastation of adultery, join Vicki Hitzkiss, Kent Edwards, and Nathan Norman as they have a conversation with Jesus on this very topic by examining Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life, into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through the Gospel of Matthew. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30, as we join their discussion. Nathan, Vicki, do you know people who have suffered the kind of anguish that those Ashley Madison customers had? You know, I do. I have a friend whose husband was a deacon, mm. and she and I are an elder. He wasn't just a deacon, he was an elder, and he had an affair. And when I was going through this, I said, do you think there will be regret? And she said, Vicki, I think one of the most awful things Satan does is down the road there is always regret. Hmm. And that's that's what happened. I think Satan is a master of temptation and then later on there's regret. Yeah. Yeah. I I was acquainted with a man, he was going into vocational ministry. And his wife was actually the person signing up for the website, which is kind of against uh, the norm because usually mm-hmm. it's it's the men. Um, but she was on there. And then he found out, the church found out, and the church did not respond well to him or her in trying to deal with it. I mean, it blew up not only their marriage, it blew up their life. Uh, he is not a Christian. In fact, he is running a uh, anti-Christian uh, uh, website and, uh, wow. and podcast now. And uh, yeah, he's, he's pretty anti-Christianity, uh, uh, which is ironic because he's angry at God and Jesus for the sin that, that his wife got entangled with. Huh. But it's ruined his faith. Wow. Oh, that's a shame, isn't it? And we, we as Christians need to hear that mm-hmm. because... He didn't do the sinning she did, mm-hmm. right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. He he, sh- he should be he should have been loved, and and she should have been loved in right. her own way, yep. held accountable but loved. It's just it's it's one of the, it's one of those sins that um, the church doesn't do well. No, I, I you know during COVID uh, this happened a lot, but I had two close friends and the wife cheated on the husband and uh, ruin the marriage. And I'm friends with both of them on social media still. And I was talking to my mother-in-law about it. And I said, you know, whenever I see her picture come up on, you know, whatever, I just get so angry and, you know, at her and everything. And she just, she rebuked me and she said, you don't know what she went through. 
and you don't know what he went through. And uh, you're a Christian minister for crying out loud. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, know, you need to <laughs> show some compassion. And, and I received that, and she was right. But uh, oh, it, it, the the devastation of it is incredible. Yeah, I know two uh, men who were unfaithful to their wives, uh, ministers, and it uh, marked their ministry forever. Obviously hurt their marriage. I know of another man whose wife, as you've just mentioned, was unfaithful to him. That ended up ending his ministry. Devastating, devastating. I think that's why Jesus speaks specifically about the sin of adultery in verses Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. Before we jump into that right away and explain Jesus' strategy, for how to avoid the consequences of adultery. I think it's important to note that this is a smaller section of a larger sermon. Jesus began preaching this sermon in the first part of chapter 5 with eight Beatitudes. The first two Beatitudes spoke of people mourning over their sinfulness, repenting. The next two talk about full submission to the Lord, wanting his will to be done. And the last three talk about the behavioral change, transformation that occurs when a a would-be disciple of Jesus lives these Beatitudes. And if they do, Jesus says next in his sermon that they will be salt and light in a dark and decaying world. How? As we saw two weeks ago, not by merely obeying the surface meaning of God's commandments, but by allowing God's laws to morally transform every aspect of their lives, to create what he called a internal righteousness. So, two weeks ago, we looked at how Jesus used the commandment of murder to create internal uh, righteousness, but now he turns his attention to adultery. In fact, uh, it's pretty clear that he's changed topics when you read verse 27, isn't it? Yes, and it's pretty clear what he's talking about. He said, you have heard (laughs) that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, that's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some might say, oh, that's just moralism. But Jesus goes deeper than that. While every law Jesus uses in Matthew 5 is relevant to us today, It's worth pausing to consider this commandment about adultery. (laughs) I came across some surveys that talked about adultery. One recent survey said 46% of all the respondents who were in a monogamous relationship said they had affairs. Wow. That doesn't seem... Wow. 46%. And Um, that's who admitted it. That's amazing. Right. And in another survey, between 60 and 68% of European and American men and women admitted to cheating once, while 32 to 40% admitted to having more frequent affairs. (laughs) That's just unreal. Stunning. Uh, It makes me say, okay, I know of a few incidents of adultery, but how many more are there? This is, this is an epidemic. And, and, and think of the consequences. I mean, what happens to a marriage when one or both partners aren't faithful to their vows? Usually the marriage fails. A counselor said, if you cannot trust your partner, you do not have a relationship. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you think your partner's faithful and your partner is not, and you find that out, Oh, your world falls apart. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the, the key is trust, right? Trust, how, how can you trust anything anymore? Right. How can you have conversation? It's almost like you, you never knew the person, right? It's such a, it, it is one of the most intimate, painful betrayals. Yeah, because there's nothing more intimate than having a sexual relationship with someone, is there? Well, and you think, you think, if my if my spouse commits adultery, I'll leave. But it's it's not like that. I mean, when the Bible says the two become one, you you may or may not want to leave. And the funny thing is, 
it's it's not the sex it's the emotional tie you you don't you don't want that violated right mm. there's no more solemn promise we make to any other person in life than make a covenant to say that i will love you and be faithful to you till death us do part and if that's broken as you said if the trust is gone communication starts to dry up the relationship begins to turn sour not that it can't ever be repaired but it will never be what it was or what it could have been there is a there's a damage that's done in that relationship that is devastating that being so <laughs> most people most of us are aware of that what causes people to commit adultery i mean why is it so prevalent if the damage is so severe? Well, there's lots of reasons. I mean, some people are dissatisfied with their marriage or, or their marriage is going through a rough time, which happens when you're married to a person for any amount of time. Mm -hmm. and or, so the or they're going through a rough time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're just going through a rough time and, and want to prove themselves. I read an article about Jackie Kennedy yesterday, and her father had cheated and cheated and cheated. Mm -hmm. And then she did not want her husband to cheat. And I can't remember if she, I think she had already married him. And her mother-in-law, uh, I think she talked to all of the women. And she said to them, this is the way it is. And your best bet is to just look the other way. Wow. And, so sometimes and it, it's family history, right? It's, yeah. Yeah. It's just the family. Mm. And you just decide I'm going to put up with it. Or not. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes there's abuse of power, right? I mean, we've seen that when we went through for, uh, First and Second Samuel, didn't we? Right, with David and Bathsheba. And, and we see it right now. There's uh, a, a clergy sex abuse crisis where you have a pastor or priest who has all kinds of authority and power having sexual relations with his congregant. And, and we've, uh, we now understand better that, that there can never be consent mm -hmm. in that relationship because there's always this huge power differentiation. And I thought you were talking about, I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you were talking about President Trump. When he said, we see it right now, he said, I can do anything I want. <laughs> Women will just let me grab them. Yeah. Well, that, yep, yeah, that too. I, well, I remember during the Clinton era with the whole Monica Lewinsky thing, <laughs> my mom and a neighbor having a conversation and and my neighbor was like i don't know who would sleep with him anyways look at him and my mom was like it has nothing to do with the looks it has everything to do with the power yeah yeah which is interesting because i've heard christian counselors uh tell me that um adultery is really has very little to do with someone's physical attraction it typically has to do with times of great stress that someone is going through. Someone comes alongside to help them, legitimately help them in that time of stress. That creates, begins to create an emotional bond. And unless they're careful, it slowly begins to move forward into, uh, into an affair. Times of great stress make us vulnerable, vulnerable to the, giving in to the temptation of adultery. Another cause of adultery can be just, frankly, dissatisfaction with the marriage. If one partner begins to emotionally withdraw or physically withdraw, that can, that could be an impetus. Mm -hmm. So with all these opportunities and so many people giving in to this uh, temptation, how can we protect our marriages? And uh, even if you're not married, how do we remain pure before marriage? Well, you may remember Jesus twofold strategy in interpreting the law. We looked at it in terms of murder, but now we can look at it in terms of adultery. And his twofold strategy was first, identify the root cause of this sin, and then secondly, ruthlessly remove it from our lives. What does Jesus identify as the root cause of adultery? I think we see it in verse 28, don't we? In verse 28, it says, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, this reminds me of Jimmy Carter, precious Jimmy Carter, but I tell you that any, <laughs> because he said he did this, I think everybody has, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
Hmm. So the root cause of adultery, what causes adultery? Lust. So it may seem like an obvious question, but what is lust? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's actually a really good question because there has, especially within the church, like, okay, so we're not going to lust and we don't want to lust because we don't want to fall in there. And so I think uh, the pendulum has swung all the other way. I've, I've had extensive conversations with my wife about about this topic because it's not lust to notice and appreciate the attractiveness mm -hmm. of another person. Sure. The problem is that a lot of church people are like, okay, don't even look, <laughs> right? Like you, know, you see an attractive woman, bounce your eyes. And I'm like, you know, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. And then you're going to run into something or out into the middle of the road. If you see someone that's attractive, mm -hmm. don't objectify them. Instead, you want to spiritualize it, say, wow, there is a beautiful woman. There is an attractive man. Praise mm -hmm. God that he, he made that person that attractive. I mean, I, I said that I've said that in multiple sermons and people are just like, what? Yes, there are attractive <laughs> people out there in the world that you are not married to. And it's OK and good to acknowledge that reality and move on with your life. Right. <laughs> um, it's when you begin to fantasize, it's when you begin to visualize and sexualize mm -hmm. the person. Uh, that's where we get the term objectification from. You turn them mm. into an object for your own gratification where it starts to become a problem, where they're starting to live in your headspace. Right. So lust is when a glance becomes a passion, when you begin to visualize or fantasize about uh, sexual involvement with that person. I love the quote that Martin Luther made, that it's not wrong to have a bird fly over your head, but it is wrong to allow it to build a nest in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. You can notice, but you don't, it doesn't go further than that. Mm -hmm. Jesus was tempted in every way as which we are. He saw attractive people, but he did not sin. He didn't build a nest in his hair. I, how does our society encourage lust? I mean, it, lust has been with us since the beginning of time. But do you think that our society seems to be going out of its way to promote lust? Oh, I have a friend who's an advertising executive. And when she first started, she had no experience at all. But she was, she was clever. She's funny. And she wrote these ads and sent them in. And they were <laughs> very sexual. Just unbelievable. And she got the job because <laughs> sex sells. Mm. And... I, in fact, I have two friends, and um, I have a couple friends in advertising, and all of their ads are really sexy. They're they're clever, they're funny, but yes, our society is all about selling sex. That's that's how it's done. Yeah, uh, and we're bipolar about it too, right? We're schizophrenic almost because we're we're in this Me Too movement, which in general is a good thing. We do not want right. to abuse individuals within the Hollywood system or good anywhere. Good point. Right? Yep. And we're like, yeah, me too, me too. Um, okay, so now we're going to have sex scenes in movies. We're going to have a, a coach to make sure that no one's sexual boundaries are violated. It's like, <laughs> okay, so we're going to have a referee now as we sexualize people? <laughs> it's absolute insanity. Uh, but it does, and they're not going to get rid of it because it... It sells. Because it sells, right? right. I, I remember years ago, I was going to see Lord of the Rings for the billionth time in the movie theaters. And I remember we were in line and this one guy was like, yeah, is there any nudity in this thing? And one of the other guys was like, no, it was written by a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if you go to look at... Uh, car um, ads in magazines you'll often find somebody uh, attractive person draped over the car uh, through the years i've enjoyed boating and you get boating magazines and uh, they suddenly come up with a swimsuit edition and you go oh give me a break on that <laughs> show me the boat for crying out loud uh, 
Well, you think um, about tool ads. You know, you don't just see a wrench and a pair of pliers. You see some <laughs> scantily dressed girl, you know, hanging onto the toolbox, and you think, I better go get those tools. <laughs> <laughs> because a socket set quite uh, by itself isn't very sexy, is That's it? That's exactly draw your right. No, I, I'm a comic fan, right? And I read comics, and oh my gosh, the amount, these are drawn figures, right? These, right? these aren't actual people, but the hypersexualization of of the characters, both men and women, right, of course, um, is 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 everywhere in there. In fact, I remember the comedian Michael J. Nelson. Uh, he's not a Christian comedian, but he is a Christian. He was commenting on this. He's like, "Yep, men like naked women. God help them. They even like the silhouettes on mud flaps of eighteen wheelers." <laughs> Just, but it's also true. In addition to all the examples we've just stated. But there's that massive pornography industry mm. that we are faced with today that has come with the internet. It is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry and it continues to grow. And in fact, I find it interesting to hear that the pornography industry has been at the forefront of technology, pushing technology forward so they can have more immersive, more seductive, more probably realistic Tempting. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah of course more yeah. realistic yeah and and you know now with ai and the deep fakes and so on it becomes such a temptation for so many people and it uh, lust is everywhere nathan have you ever heard about the effects of consuming porn it's interesting because uh to your comment earlier pornography has ironically sickingly pervaded a lot of of um media innovations right so so the early film and mm -hmm. um the the vhs um yeah. and betamax right that was that was perpetuated by the desire to have pornography at home the internet and fast bandwidth all of these mm -hmm. things right and so it's it's very um seductive and sadistic and uh, difficult i remember back in 2008 there was a christian book called wired for intimacy how pornography hijacks the male brain and it was by uh, struthers i believe this was in 2008 and i read it and i said wow this makes a hundred percent sense but uh, it got lambasted in uh, the publishing world and also in the scientific world hmm. because his argument was when uh, people men and women view pornography on a regular basis mm -hmm. it rewires the brain to uh, no longer see people as people but to see people as objects for your own gratification wow and he got ridiculed and everything and now of course i think it was about five years ago uh, newsweek time magazine and and scientific journals have all found that that data is actually true is that when you are looking at pornography so if you if you hook up a person's brain uh, to like a brain spec scan mm -hmm. and you show them a picture of a person of the opposite sex, no, nothing sexualized, just a picture of the opposite sex. Uh, someone who is not regularly using pornography, the part of the brain that is associated with relationships will light up. If uh, you have a person who is using pornography hooked up to the brain spec scan and you show them the same picture, not sexualized, just a picture of someone of the opposite sex, the part of the brain associated with objects lights up. Wow. So we, are, as a culture, are training ourselves to uh, see people not as people, as objects. And so I think for, I mean, this is beyond the scope of this conversation, but I think if you look at a lot of the social ills, why do we hate each other so much? Is it social media? Yeah, that helps. But if so many people are consuming pornography, we don't see the people as people, we see people as objects. And if you're not doing what I want you to do, I'm going to hate you and it's okay and it's justified. You look at the young people and the violence happening within school systems. How can they do that? Is it violent video games? I don't think that's what the case is. I think it's all this pornography use. And mm -hmm. now I no longer see people as people. They are objects. Well, and to your point, I am recently have seen the amount of screen time that younger kids have after school. It has massively increased over the past decade. Uh, parents are at home kids have nothing to do when they get home they're not supervised it's all screen time and, well, and some they of it play violent they play violent games which violent is games yes, like that, pornography yeah it's terrible so 
Jesus says, do not commit adultery. If you want to get rid of adultery, it's not just not sleeping with someone. It means getting to the root of the issue and dealing with lust. <laughs> but then, now that he's identified the root of, for the command, uh, what do we do with it? Does he ruthlessly remove it from our lives? Well, look at verse 29 and 30. Well, hopefully there's some hyperbole here, but you can tell he's serious. <laughs> he says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Okay, so Vicki, you mentioned there's some hyperbole here. Which part is hyperbole? Well, I don't think he really means gouge out your eye and chop off your hand. No, but I do I, think right. I do think he's saying you stay away from from that. There, there was a song we learned as kids. Be careful, little eye, what you see. Be careful, mm -hmm. you know, on and on. I think he's saying if if you're looking at that, stop it. Turn off the computer, walk away, change the program, stop it. You don't want to get involved in that because it's very, very addicting. Yeah, he's giving their attention. If your eye is wandering, if your hand is doing what it shouldn't be doing, uh, he says, cut it off. And I agree with you, he doesn't mean literally do that. But he does mean cut that out of your life. If your iPad is a problem, get rid of your iPad. Nothing wrong with an iPad, but it must not lead you into sin. Lust can lead to the sin of adultery, and it's the essence of adultery anyway. And take note of what is not hyperbole in those verses you just read. What is literal? The wages of sin is death. So when he says, cut it out of your life, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If lust takes over your life, there is hell to pay. He says it again in the latter part of verse 30. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Do you think he's talking about hell? I mean, he's not saying you'll lose your salvation if you're a Christian. He just means your whole life will be ruined, right? No, I think he is. I think if you give in consistently to lust, if you choose to live like the devil, God will give you the privilege to join him. You've got to get a hold of this. You've got to cut it out of your life. This is not a superficial thing that doesn't really matter. These are not just innocent mind games. This separates you from God. So, so back up. This is what James is talking about when he says faith apart from works is dead. If, if, you, if your life is marked by sin, you don't have a vibrant, you don't have a real faith. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, if... If you're comfortable with living with lust, mm -hmm. then you are separated from God. Hmm. Yeah, there is a world, I, when I work with people who are struggling with pornography or using pornography, I'll put it that way, uh, there is a world of difference between someone who hates it but lacks the power to stop and the person who loves it and doesn't care, right? Usually a wife or parent comes, oh, and if someone doesn't care and they're just frustrated that they're caught and someone's trying to stop them, there is absolutely nothing I can do. Right. But if someone's like, I hate this, you know, and I want to stop, but I lack the power to do so. Well, wow, that's, that's a world of difference, right? That's that, that we can work with that God can work with and through. Hmm. So Jesus is clearly saying this is a negative reaction action to get rid of lust, cut it out of your life, whatever it is, be ruthless, be brutal. But there's also something we could do positively to get rid of inappropriate lust, right? Bring it home. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what he's saying. He's he, saying says in, he says in Proverbs 5, drink water from your own cistern, running <laughs> water from your own well. And, you know, not, not, not to be too light here, but this is why it's important no matter where, I'm serious about this. This is why it's important for wives or husbands with, with a low libido. Suck it up. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Ah, 
Welcome, yes. everyone, to the most uncomfortable episode of Crosstalk. No, but it's true. That's that's a real part of marriage, and it that it's it important is. to keep that alive. It is. No question. It is. He's not saying don't enjoy sex. He is saying within the bounds of marriage, let it flourish. Absolutely. Jesus is... Yeah, and I think, I, I would think even for uh, single people, so if we want to you know, negatively remove the things or situations that are triggering you, right? Uh, but positively, you know, in addition to that, what if you're not married, right? Or, or you can't find a spouse, right? That beco That's becoming an ever-increasing mm -hmm. issue. So pornography, lust, um, what are those things? Those things are consumerism, right? They're trying to consume and objectify other people. So what's the opposite of that? Well, it, it's beauty and relationships, foster mm -hmm. relationships, foster beauty, find, find the beauty and different people are wired different ways. Some people are going to find beauty in, in a variety of things, but find beauty in music and spend time almost as a spiritual discipline. If you, if I can be so bold, but, but spend time seeking out the good, true and beautiful, uh, mm -hmm. whether that's uh, in music, whether that is in um, nature or gardening or a craft you have or writing or um, spending time with with relationships. I think those are also they distill the, the false promise of objectifying people. If only this person would do what I want, then my life would be fulfilled. I think fostering beauty is a, a huge thing because that is a giving of self rather than a taking, hmm. which is what lust and adultery ultimately are. Yeah, well said. Adultery is sin. It is caused by lust. And Jesus here warns us that if lust is allowed to flourish, it will destroy our souls. Let's heed Jesus' warning and be so internally transformed by this law of Moses that people see that in a world filled with adultery and lust, we stand out shining like stars. We are so radically different with this internal righteousness that people are drawn to our Savior. Because in a world filled with adultery, purity is powerful. So let's heed Solomon's advice that he gives in Proverbs chapter 6. This commandment is a lamp, keeping you from your neighbor's wife. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. We should be sexually faithful to our spouses. Or, if we're single, celibate. We should radically remove whatever causes us to lust because the Bible tells us sexual sin can destroy us. I trust that today's discussion of God's Word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the Word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's Word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more about this educational nonprofit organization, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by rating it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find it. Be sure to listen next Friday as we continue our discussion of the Gospel of Matthew. You won't want to miss it. Nathan, have you ever heard about the effects of consuming porn? Yeah, and I, I appreciate you uh, rephrase the question from what you have written in our script because it says, Nathan, what have you learned about the effects of consuming <laughs> pornography? <laughs> <laughs> well, I keep okay. a journal after every <laughs> failure. <laughs> no, it, 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 you can put that in at your own peril. <laughs>